welcome to Textile Talks. I'm Haley Butler, the Communications Coordinator for the International Quilt Museum. While we gather, I'm going to promote our sponsors and I'm going to share some more information about Textile Talks. Textile Talks features weekly presentations and panel discussions from the International Quilt Museum, Quilt Alliance, San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles, Studio Art Quilt Associates and Surface Design Association. These programs are held online at 2 p.m. Eastern and 11 a.m. Pacific on Wednesdays. And today's presentation is going to be on our, the International Quilt Museum's exhibition from the studio. Next week, the textile talk will be called Social, uh, Social Cultural and Political Excellence in Fibers presented by uh, Schwinther Art Center. Textile Talks would not be here without you and your individual donations. The total to run Textile Talks is over $42,000. Sponsorships cover a lot of that, but we do need your help funding the rest. If you enjoy Textile Talks, consider making a donation. Lucy's going to place a link in the chat if you'd like to help donate and outset the cost of this production. So now I'm going to hand it over to Carolyn Ducey, Artist B. James, Curator of Collections at the International Quilt Museum to get our program started. If you have any questions during today's program, go ahead and type them into the Q&A function and we'll do our best at the end to answer as many questions that we have. So with that, let's welcome Carolyn. Thank you so much, Haley. Thank you, Lucy. It's great to be here with everyone. Um, I'm really excited to talk about um, one of the current exhibitions here at the International Quilt Museum, which is a part of our 25th anniversary celebration. It's still going on here at the museum, and we're having such an amazing summer with all of our guests. So today, um, the, the show that we're talking about from the studio features quilts from the Robert and Artist James collection. And they were our donors, of course, that um, began everything for us here in Lincoln, um, donated about a thousand quilts to the university, helped us to establish at that time was a study center. And then um, eventually grew into our museum and our amazing collection that now um, numbers over 8,000 quilts. But we wanted to focus as we celebrated our 25th on the James Collection quilts because they were such an amazing gift and set, formed such an incredible base for our collection. And the studio or art quilt segment of this collection was something that was pulled together by Penny McMorris and artist James. So really Penny McMorris is the curator of this particular exhibition and I'm just speaking for her today. We do have a few little video clips we're going to show from Penny and her talking about the work that she did with the Jameses. It's a part of our 25th anniversary celebration and we did a wonderful panel with Penny, Michael James, and Pauline Burbage and we're going to talk about them today and that is available on the International Quilt Museum's YouTube site. So um, YouTube site. So if you wanted to go in and check out that video, you can. And you can also see the video that talks about our beginnings, our early history, and our um, new visions, which is talking about the development of the international side of the collection. Um, we also have a wonderful publication. I'm just going to plug today the evolving vision, the James Collection 1997 to 2022. And this is available on our website if you're interested. And it's the very first time after 25 years that the entire James Collection is featured in one book um, with it, some essays from Penny and myself and my colleague Maren Hansen. So if you are interested, go to our website for that um, publication. So um. I wanted to, first of all, to introduce Penny McMorris to you in a more thorough way. Um, Penny currently is the president and co-founder of the Electric Quilt Company, which is a leading quilt design software company. Previously, she was curator of the Owens Corning Fiberglass Corporation Art Collection and producer of three different series for PBS on quilting. Quilting, Quilting 2, and the Great American Quilt. And when I was doing research for this presentation, I did find that the original um, PBS location, which was in Bowling Green, Ohio, has posted a number of the episodes from the Great American Quilt. So we'll put that link in the chat so you can go back and check out some of Penny's early um, exhibitions. Um, 
Penny was an art commentator, an advisor to the Jameses as they built their collection, and an art historian. She's also the author of the book Crazy Quilts, was the first book on that particular genre of traditional quilts. And Penny also played a large role in the development of a, an exhibition called The Art Quilt. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more in a moment. But first, let's go to, um, I'm gonna share my screen and we'll see a little bit of a video with Penny McMorris. I was in Milwaukee at that time and searching for what's going on in the world. And so my mother would pass down her old House Beautiful, Vogue's House and Garden deck magazines. And I read them with interest because it told somewhat what was going on in other parts of the country and world. And I was just bowled away. And I think Michael James will have the same feeling about seeing quilts in magazines because as early as um, the late 60s, 1968, for example, Vogue had this fantastic spread of Gloria Vanderbilt, AKA Anderson Cooper's mother, mm -hmm. um, in a patchwork room that she had created, ceiling, floors, walls, it was just spectacular. And then I began seeing uh, quilts made by mountain artisans, which was a quilting co-op at that time, where artists would design quilts to be made, and they would be made and make money for the women who were working in this cooperative. Um, often they were in the South or they were in Appalachia. So they were fantastic quilts. And that piqued my interest in quilts. And then you began seeing all around the country antique quilt shows, including the book for um, Jonathan Holstein's Abstract Design in American Peace Quilts. And I remember as uh, I was like 22 then going with friends who weren't even that interested in quilts, and they would sit with me and page and page and page through. And we would talk about what we loved about it and how it worked together and look at that yellow block in the corner that just makes it kind of sing. And I found that's what I really liked to do. Now I did make quilts, but my main interest, I only made maybe six or seven. My main interest was not in seeing what I could do, but seeing what other people could do. And I think that's, that's the art historian versus artist in me. So Penny was really involved um, early on, as I mentioned, in numerous ways with quilts, but she really got to know the Jameses in the mid 1980s when she worked with um, a partner, Michael Kyle, a California dealer and collector on an exhibition called The Art Quilt. And she and Michael came up with the idea of inviting 16 artists to make the quilt of their dream. The only stipulation that they had for the exhibition is that they really wanted a large quilt. So they asked the artist to really make something with an incredible scale. So um, they eventually showed 25 quilts by these 16 artists. It opened in California in October of 1986 and then went on to travel for two years. And this is when Penny and the Jameses really connected. And in fact, the Jameses subsequently purchased a number of quilts from the art quilt show that came into the, their collection. And it was interesting because um, Robert James talked about seeing the art quilt exhibition. He said, artists and I didn't really understand what made a contemporary quilt great art. Um, but they were, um, he talks about then meeting Penny and Michael and he said, they were convinced that the quilts in the art quilt were really good work. We exhibited the exhibit twice and we purchased a large number of quilts. 
So over the, the years that Penny acted as advisor, she purchased or advised the quilts, advised the Jameses on purchasing about a hundred quilts for the collection. And she and artists really didn't come up with a really rigid way of looking at quilts. She, they really just had a lot of communication back and forth. So our next segment, Penny's gonna just talk a little bit about that process that she and artists used when considering quilts. I told them my idea was not to come up with a framework of we need one of these and one of these and one of these and we'll come up with a budget. Um, we didn't do any of that. I just told them that I would look and try to find them the best quilts that were out there and that that was my job. I thought we should just see what was out there and try to get the best. And they agreed to that. And so we started by correspondence back and forth and back and forth. And then every once in a while, when I was going to be in New York, I would let them know and I would take the train to Chappaqua and artists and I especially would meet. Now, when there was Quilt National, Bob, of course, was there with artists and we would hang together and um, discuss the quilts and walk around and then um, he would decide and she would decide whether they wanted to buy any of them. It was interesting when I spoke to Penny because I asked her specifically, I said, um, the quilts that, that she selected for the Jameses are, really have a timeless quality to them, which is a, one of those words we hear tossed about often. And what does that really mean? It means a quilt that you really can't put in a specific time period because it just works so outstandingly in its own way. And when I asked Penny what it was that she saw in quilt and could she tell me what and describe that, she said she really can't. She's just looking for something in the quilts that really hits her. And there's an intangible emotional quality to her reaction. And so it's very much a subjective thing with her. Um, but I have to say that the um, quilts that she selected um, have proven to really um, hold up to time. I think the other thing that was really exceptional about the artists that she worked with is that it worked in two different ways. It worked for the artists because, because that they had the support of someone acquiring their work, it really gave them the impetus to go on and continue their work as artists. And many, many of the artists that we spoke to said that was a critical time period for them where that support was really what helped them to decide that they would continue on in their career. Um, but it also, um, the artists have been in that exhibition, every artist that we are shown has gone on to have a li lifelong career as an artist and supporting themselves that way. And so I think it is really an amazing gift that Penny gave to them, but was also something that she really recognized in those artists that they had something in their art, artistic voice, something in the, the way they were approaching quilt making that really did make them shine. So let's go ahead now and look at quilts from the exhibition. I wanted to start, of course, with our two Faith Ringgold quilts because these are absolute gems of our collection. Um, Faith did a pair of quilts in 1986. This is the men mask face quilt number two. We also have the matching piece, the women that Faith created. These pieces are both about 69 inches by 62 inches. And they are actually painted quilts. They are painted with an acrylic paint. And I chose this medium to share my screen today because rather than doing a PowerPoint, I can actually zoom in on our high res photos. So I can, we can really take a look at some of the artistry of these quilts today. So here you can see the painted surfaces that Faith Ringgold created. They are framed by a fabric border, but the actual faces and torsos are painted on kind of a heavy canvas. Um, the other thing that I love about these pieces, um, 
each one has a sequin uh, in the pupil of the eye and it gives kind of a glitter to the images but it also when you have the quilts hanging as you walk by them and this is something our fourth graders always notice the eyes seem to follow you um that it's such a direct outward gaze i think it has so much power and um so i think that was an incredible um accomplishment but faith actually wrote about these pieces um and I'm gonna quote her now. These are the, are the first two quilts I did for my very first exhibition at the Bernice Steinbaum Gallery in Soho. I'm thinking of the face as a mask because of the way I see faces. It's coming from an African vision of the mask, which is the thing we carry around with us. It's our presentation, our front. I guess I had fun doing it, but it had hard memories for me. I was pleased with the results, but every time I look at both of those pictures, I feel a little bit of the pain I felt in trying to put it together. I had something I was trying to say, and sometimes the message is an easy transmission, and sometimes it's a difficult one, but I love the power of saying it, so I'm going to do it, whether it's hard or easy, because I just love the idea that I can, I can say it. So these were really interesting early pieces by Faith Ringgold. Again, I'm going to go back out so we can see the women and really an expression of just of her, her neighborhood, people that she knew, faces that she recognized, and here are the men. Um, Faith, of course, has gone on now to um, illustrate and publish numerous children's books and often does this combination of painted imagery on cloth. Um, and just of course had two retrospectives last uh, about two years ago, one in London and one in New York just wrapped up. Um, she is truly an American treasure and it is an incredible gift that we have two of her early pieces in the collection. Next, we're gonna look at Michael James's work, Aurora. Aurora was made in 1978. It measures 103 by 91 inches. And it's an early example of Michael's strip piece technique, which he became very widely known for. Um, and he talks about using the, the strip piece method as a way to explore a sense of movement and color and value transitions in the quilt. And he really liked that the idea, the explore, exploration of color worked with linear designs. And that was his focus, though this one uses a lot of the curved patterning within that strip quilting. Michael also talks about this. And again, I'm going to quote Michael. It says, Aurora is the sky and the wind and the sun and the moon. It's one of a series of pieces that I did that had to do with sky. I remember thinking when I made it that I wanted to use every piece of fabric that I owned. And I called it Aurora after the fact because I looked up the dictionary definition of Aurora and it said an atmospheric effect in which light is fractured into bands of color. And I thought that was perfect because that is exactly what I had intended to do in this piece. I remember this piece so well when I began at the Quilt Museum and I've been here almost 25 years now. Um, but I was a quilt maker and I had taken a few classes and we were taught that you used cotton with cotton, you used wool with wool, you didn't mix fabrics. And then I saw Aurora. And as I zoom in closer, you can see that Michael has used a lot of the traditional um, calico fabrics that were available in the 1970s, which were pretty limited, these little tiny ditzy prints. But he's also used some synthetics, some satins, some he really chose the fabrics for how they would reflect light and that was what was important to him and that was a revelation to me that you could mix things like this the other thing about this quilt that was um, interesting is that this was the last quilt that michael james hand quilted and he really did do some spectacular quilting in this piece you can see it throughout especially if i go to the darker sections i think the quilting really stands out but and, and Michael did use, he used a stab technique. Um, I watched him, um, I watched a video that when he was uh, early on going out and doing gigs and was here in Nebraska, and he would actually do just a stitch at a time stabbing through um, the layers of the quilt. But after this, he chose to go to, to machine quilting like many artists did. Um, 
Aurora is still just stunningly beautiful. Um, even after, um, gosh, how many years has it been now? 30 years since this piece was made. Um, the fabrics are holding up beautifully, partly due to the conditions that we keep our quilt. And it's really important to remember that temperature and humidity are very important when you're looking at the longevity of your quilt. And Michael, I think you're gonna see in the next few quilts as we go through some of these different artists that early on in these artists' career, they were really looking at how to create dimensionality in a flat surface, a one-dimensional source. They were also looking at ways that you could create color or, um, uh, or light uh, and the way light would come from one direction or the other. Um, many of these artists were trained artists in uh, some kind of a fine arts format, whether it was pottery or painting, like in Michael's case. But they really turned to fabric very early on because it was just much more satisfying to them and it really called to them. Um, the other thing that was interesting as I was working on this presentation was that so many of the quilts that we're looking at early on were really large scale. Now, as I mentioned, Penny and Michael Kyle had requested large quilts for the art quilt show. But I think it's just interesting that artists were really um, exploring really large scale work. And whether that's because they were still coming from earlier quilts that they made in more of a traditional style when they were beginning. So this was a format that was comfortable to them. Or was it that they were trying to make a real, a, a, an artistic statement? And, and part of that statement was the sheer size of the quilts. But um, we're gonna look at a lot of really large quilts. And I have to admit, it's something I, that really appeals to me, um, partly because here at the museum, we have 16 foot ceilings. So the scale is perfect in our galleries. But I love the fact that these artists were really making bold choices and really exploring the medium in a, in a way that, that you know, showed no fear. They did not know if people were gonna collect their quilts. They didn't know if these quilts were going to make it into museums at the time. And, and I love that they put a lot of this time and energy into these overwhelming works. The next artist we're going to look at is, of course, one of my favorites. And I say that about all these quilts, my favorites is Pauline Burbage. And this is Finn. And Finn was made in 1983. Um, Pauline is from Scotland. Um, she is a leading quilter in the UK world. This piece is 93 and a half inches by 91 inches. And I think you can see, as I was saying, that kind of uh, how it's in some ways similar to um, Aurora in the fact that it is using some of this um, technique of using just linear patterns. I'm not sure if Pauline was actually strip piecing quilts like Michael did. She used um, a very specific um, graph um, example. She drew out the quilts before she made them. In fact, she shared with us a couple of her early drawings. So she, she really thought this through and mapped this out. But what I love about this is the way your eye never settles on this quilt. The, the dynamic tension that she's created in the piece is incredible. The sense of depth in it that you see as your eye moves from space to space. And again, that idea that this quilt has such dimension that spaces move in and out is something that um, we see in a lot of these early explorations. Um, the other thing that I think is really intriguing with the number of these artists that we're looking at is that when they started out in the 80s and the entire exhibition that we're doing is from the mid 80s with a couple of very early 1990 quilts, Many of these artists started out in a really structured format, some even in a very specific block format, but as their careers have evolved, they've moved into something that is much more naturalistic. Um, today, Pauline's work, and, and she just had a major exhibition in Scotland of her work. Now she is doing what she calls fabric painting. And so she is creating her pieces in kind of a free form way. And they are much, much more um, closely aligned to the natural setting in which she lives. So she's really moved away from these earlier pieces. That's one of the advantages that we have at the museum is to represent some of these artists over their career. So you can go to our um, online website 
and you can look under Burbage, under, I would use just the last name and search her out and you can see a real selection of Pauline's work and see that development over time. And I think that's always really exciting when we're looking at our um, quilters. Now, an artist who stayed pretty true to her beginnings is Terry Mangott from um, New Mexico. This is a piece, a uh, rather small piece, um, and this was not um, from that art quilt show or from the, the early years. This is um, from, it's from 1984. This came to us much later than the other quilts did. Um, this piece is called Memory Jars. It was made in 1984. It's 31 inches by 47 inches. So as I said, relatively small. But this one was the last quilt that the Jameses turned over to the museum, and they did not do that until 2013. Um, when we would visit the Jameses' home in Chappaqua, New York, this was over their mantle, and it was a really treasured um, piece, one of their absolute favorites. Memory jars, it also says Kentucky trinket jars. It's embroidered in the lower left corner, both memory jars and Kentucky trinket jars, because that's a, it is a tradition in Kentucky and you can find them online, old jugs, whiskey jugs, things that were had clay applied to them. And then you would just stick your little bits and pieces into that clay and it would dry that way. And then the idea was that you would use your jar or jug to put little bits and pieces of happy memories. And I, I love that so much. Um, this piece is embellished. And of course, Terry Mangott is known for her embellishment. She is the queen of embellishments. And if you go, if I zoom in just a little bit, you can see buttons and ribbon and little figures, little plastic charms. Uh, there's a little piece of a, a the top of clasp of a, a metal clasp of a, a purse here. I always like to show off the false teeth, the little false teeth charm, and my cursor is over it here at the bottom. Um, but what I find intriguing, um, we just had an exhibition of Terry's work. Um, we called it Capturing the Moment, works by Terry Mangott. Um, and it was work that was done during the pandemic, some very new things she had done. But Terry has collected trinkets and little bits and bobs her whole life. And some of those that are on our very latest quilts show up in her earliest quilt. So she talked about how um, a neighbor in her home um, back in um, Ohio had a shop and she had boxes and boxes of these little bits and pieces. And when the, when the shop went out of, of business, Terry bought those boxes. And I think she's still delving into them here and there. Um, you see a lot of Catholic imagery on um, Terry's quilt. She's still very much kind of tied to her Catholic upbringing, but they just have such a wonderful, playful way about them. Again, we have a wonderful interview with Terry talking about how she makes her quilts. And I asked her, how do you know when a quilt is finished? Because that embellishment is the last stage she does. And she said, you know, I really don't know. I just do it. And I know when it's done. Um, so she uses embellishments in such interesting ways. And I'm going to show another manga quilt here in just a little bit. Um, because um, she did have a piece in the art quilt show. And um, we have another that was an early example that is a particular favorite of mine. Next, we have um, Therese May and Therese May's piece, Saw Blade, was made in 1985. It's 69 inches by 77 inches. And Terry uses a really interesting painting technique. So I'm gonna zoom in so that you can see that a lot of what looks like a, a printed textile in these quilts is actually a painted textile. And Therese has just a really fun, uh, kind of joyous way of making her quilts. You can see she leaves strings attached. She doesn't trim them. That's actually a part of the design. She's kind of used a piping to delineate some of her shapes in the quilt. The saw blade image was actually something she saw at a county fair and loved. So she went back and used it as inspiration for her work. And she talks a lot about how um, she really likes thick, often crusty surfaces of layered color and texture. So she says adding paint can either make or break the work and you can lose a lot of time if the paint doesn't work. Um, she does really, um, 
has always done a lot of embellishment. So you'll see buttons on this quilt as well. She does a lot of embroidery and a lot of handwork to add layers of textile, um, texture, color, and tactile interest to the quilt surface. And um, she is using an acrylic paint just like Faith Ringle does on her fabric surfaces. And I think these days she also does design fabric. In the lower corner here, you can see some um, vintage fabric that she's also incorporated into her piece. Next, we have Jude Larzelier, and I have always just had a really soft spot for red and blue jars. Red and blue jars was made in 1985. And Judith has been making quilts since 1978. She was trained as a painter in New Jersey and earned her MFA there. And she describes her, her quilts as both abstract and geometric. I feel that I'm exploring the same problems, expressing the same inspirations in my quilt as if I were a painter using oils or acrylics, but I choose colored cloth as a medium. I like the collage aspect of designing with fabric. And she designs her quilts out pretty thoroughly, but as she says, she leaves a lot of room for serendipity and for little things to happen as they go. She is using strip piecing. She cuts and recuts the pieced fabrics and machine quilts it in a process she sometimes calls flip and sew quilting. So let's take a look at the detail and you can see how she's just inserted these little flecks of color within her solid colors. And just done that in kind of a random fashion with different widths. But what I love about this piece and it took me a long time to see it. It took me until we had it up on the wall is it in essence, it's very much like a traditional log cabin um, pattern. If you look, and it's also a mirror image, top and bottom. So if you look at the center, the dark center at the top or the deep red center in the middle at the bottom half, once she has created that and built that out, you can see she's just adding strip after strip, just like you would with a log cabin block. And if you divide this right in half where that red and blue background changes, you can see that each block and you can see how that is a mirror image. I love that it is primary colors. I love that she's got the, the blue and orange, which are, are um, across from each other on the textile wheel. Um, they, it, the quilt just works on so many different levels. And I find this one just particularly appealing. So next, um, so these are some of the quilts that we featured in the exhibition, but of course we always have pieces that we can't fit into an exhibition. And in this case, there were two that I really had hoped we could show, but they are just simply too large. So we're gonna go back now to another piece by Terry Mangott. This is Dashboard Saints in memory of St. Christopher who lost his magnetism. It is 99 by 124 inches. You can see why it was difficult for us to show this piece. And here is just another classic example of Terry's work. Now she has a great story about how this quote came to be. Um, she says that she was actually out, she was driving her car with a friend and she had these little magnetic dashboard saints, which some of us may remember, these little magnets that you would put on your dash. And as she was driving past or at a stop sign with a, a car next to her, someone asked her about them. So she reached out to hand one over to the person in the other car and dropped St. Christopher. And she said that when she thought about that, she thought, well, what happens when saints aren't really saints, when they lose their sainthood? They couldn't prove that these saints ever existed and they deleted them. So when she, and now I'm quoting, she says, when I heard that my favorite saints like St. Valentine and St. Christopher weren't saints anymore, I thought, how could they make a mistake like that? And um, she goes on then to talk about the fact that um, the way the saints have, have lost their um, sainthood. And that is why at the base of this quilt here, you see St. Christopher only in his outlined form. And again, this was another quilt that I had seen often on the table as we worked on it. And um, 
really admired it so much, but I had never realized exactly what was happening in this pattern until we saw the quilt on exhibition. And the first time I saw it hanging was actually at the Houston Quilt Festival in 2000, when they showed the top 100 quilts of the century. So this is one of the quilts that was shown in that exhibition. And when you could stand back and really look at this large quilt, you could see that this is actually a highway down the middle of it. You see between two hills and then you have that night sky and this that kind of starry effect in the night sky is um, partially from the fabric and then partially from these saints cards that she found and embellished the quilt with. You can see the saint breaking up in these like little triangles throughout the quilt. And if you get close, then you can also see the um, embellishment that Terry used. So for example, the faces are all done with a really heavy embroidery, almost a Berlin work where she's satin stitched and filled the faces with um, a really thick wool embroidery. And then as we go over here, you can see that she's added rosary, she's added necklaces, she's added um, beadwork and all kinds of different things that give a three-dimensional quality to the quilts. And um, there, I, it's just an amazing piece. And it, it was one of Penny McMorris's favorites. It's one of my, uh, here I, I said again, one of my favorites, but I just think that, um, Terry just has an amazing way of looking at things and the way she creates her quilts is so interesting. Um, when we talked about how she does her work because her quilts are all hand done. She said that she sits during the day, she cuts things out, she pins them together and kind of gets them closely formulated. And then in the evening she sits and hand stitches things together. And she has done amazing work in amazing sizes. And it really is inspiring because um, if she can accomplish this sitting and working by hand, then I guess we can accomplish anything, can't we? Just amazing work. Um, and do go to our website. You can see all of our exhibitions online and you can go in and see. We did a combination of some early works that Terry did, uh, a fireworks series. We did a nest series from time that she spent um, traveling and saw these incredible nests, bird nests. And then we also did her, her pieces where she went out and painted during COVID and then would come home in the evening after spending time outside painting and recreate her, her paintings in a textile form. And then of course, lastly, she would go in and embellish them with all of the different details. So let me look at my list here and see what's next. We have another quilt that was also a part of the top 100 quilts of the century. Um, Michael James Aurora was one of the top 100 quilts of the century. And this piece by Jan Myers Newberry called Depth of Field Three, Plain View was also in that top 100. What was really interesting in that first 100 quilts that um, Penny McMorris acquired for the Jameses, 13 of the quilts were chosen in the top 100 of the century, which gives you an idea of just how fabulous Penny's eye was and how she could recognize really outstanding work. This piece is 82 inches long and 132 inches wide. So as I said, again, an artist that's working in really large scale. And just like Michael James and Pauline Burbage, she's very much working in a grid format. However, um, she's breaking it up with her use of painted um, and hand dyed fabrics. So if we zoom in on Jan's work, you can see it's really that wonderful overlay that she has of the, the grid. And even the grid has a color gradation from top to bottom. You see how the, the small squares within the grid get darker as we move lower on the, the canvas of the quilt. And then behind that, again, she's used these color gradations to create these kind of bands of color, these swaths that are really fascinating to see. And um, um, Jan is really a, considered a dye expert. She still teaches a lot of classes, but now she's gone just like Penny, or, uh, just like um, 
Colleen and Michael James has done, she's gone from this very structured um, grid type of a quilt to something that is much more free flowing. And now she's become really widely known for her shibori techniques. And so she does a lot of shibori dyeing and incorporates those into her quilt. So again, still focusing on the hand dyed aspect of, of her quilt making, but making pieces where the, the shibori dye technique is really the focus of the piece. Um, again, one, you can go and you can see Jan's work on our website and you can see this progression of her work from one time to another. And in the, um, the um, from the studio exhibition, we do feature another grid work piece of hers from the 1980s. And we've got just a couple more here. Um, we have Chris Wolf Edmonds in the exhibition, and this is actually a relatively small piece. This is just 48 and a half inches square. And Chris, just like those other early quilt artists was really exploring color movement and that definition of space in this early piece, um, Night Rainbow Five, the secondary bow. And it's somewhat hard to see as you look at it in this kind of a close up way, but when you see it up on the wall, you can see the way that night rainbow um, really crosses the quilt and the way she has really plotted out how to create that form within um, a flat textile. Chris is from Kansas. She's um, a fifth generation Kansas. And today, just like these other artists, she's really gone into a much more naturalistic approach. She's looking at nature and the kaleidoscopic palette of her sweeping Kansas terrain. And she's a graduate of the University of Kansas and has been making quilts since 1969. So, I want to go back and go back to Penny now. Um, you can see with all of the quilts that we've shown and looked at today that Penny really did have an amazing eye. And this, the sheer number of these artists who have become kind of the, the leaders in the quilt world is truly amazing. Um, and there were many more that um, I'm not showing you today. We can maybe go into our Matterport virtual gallery and take a look at a few more at the end of the program here. But I, I, I cannot stress enough the, the legacy that Penny McMorris has left with us. The fact that she has um, created or, or has recognized the work of such amazing different artists is incredible. We do have a wonderful um, keynote that um, Penny gave for our 25th um, celebration. And you can find that on our YouTube site. Um, we did panels where we discussed the, the, the early years of the Quilt Study Center and the early year of these artists and kind of brought it up to 2022. And all of those are available on our YouTube site if you'd like to go in and check them out. But the last question that I asked Penny when we were doing our interview was what she felt um, the legacy of the James collection was because it truly was one of the, um, the Jameses were one of the, if not the earliest um, collector of studio quilts. So Penny has some great um, information to share with us in this last clip of our video. Um, what, what do you feel was the James's impact on quilting and quilt history? Oh, I think it was, it was phenomenal. Um, they were the first collectors, particularly of uh, contemporary quilts. And so they would do their best to get the word out on that, sending magazine articles, talking to journalists to get um, their idea of contemporary quilts are something that people can um, collect these days. Look what is being done. And they also um, shared all of their sources with people. Uh, some collector might want to keep the source to themselves, but they were actively encouraging other people. The whole idea of the um, International Quilt Study Center Museum was to let people learn about quilts, to let them see them so that they would be well taken care of the quilts and people would find a place 
where they could see quilts from all over the world and at all different time periods and learn from them. So I think that was the, the um, there's just immense contribution that they made. No, oh, it is truly an incredible contribution and has really led us on a path um, as we have um, developed the collection over 25 years, we really have focused and made a priority of, of really representing the studio art quilt world in the best way that we can and we continue to do that. Um, we specifically had um, an amazing um, spurt of growth with the development of the Quilt National Collection. Many of the artists that we spoke about today were also Quilt National artists and had numerous pieces that were shown in that really important exhibition as well. Now, um, I see you've got a few questions, but we also do have a little bit more time. And I thought it would be interesting. I'm gonna try to take us in to our Matterport program. And this is something that you can find on the website. And it is not easy for me to get around in it particularly, which is why I used our high-res images instead of this, um, this site. But um, if you go into our website and you go into exhibitions and you look at what is now showing, you can see the evolving vision. And so here you can see that I'm on the site and that I can use the Matterport virtual gallery. And in a way it's, it's even better than those flat images we, we looked at. It gives you the feeling that you are standing right in front of the quilt. So you can zoom in, you can take a look at them. We can get us about that close to them. You can also go to click on this circle and go to the label and that will come up and it will tell you what you're looking at. And I'm gonna, you can see I'm not as good. So I'm gonna go back into the exhibition and I can just give you a few more images. Here we have Teresa um, or Joan Lindhout piece, Gaia. We have Amir River by um, Patrick Dorman. I'm gonna get myself in trouble because as soon as I say the name of these quilts, I forget the name of the artist. And then of course we have our Jan Myers Newberry piece which is called Morning Glory. And it is here next to Aurora. So you can see that this new Matterport system, which we've only been working with for a couple years now, really can give you the sense of what it's like to be in our galleries and, and walking through our exhibition and being able to zoom in on particular pieces. I will show one more. Um, that I just particularly love, which is Helen Giddens' piece. If I can get into it. This is why I didn't want to make you dizzy looking at the pictures earlier, because we have, um, you just might need to kind of get your groove down. But here we have um, Finn, and then we have Helen Giddens' piece. And Helen was also a Quilt National artist. She did a piece called Snake, and that is featured in the exhibition and a piece called The Happy Homemaker by Wendy Hewn in that show as well. So I would encourage you to go to the Matterport program online and take a look at that. And um, you can see all of our exhibitions taped that way or recorded that way and go in and look at all three of the exhibitions. In addition to an evolving vision, we have the classics, which is um, an exhibition of, um, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. We have an exhibition of the classics, which is our traditional quilts and some of the real gems from the James collection in the traditional format. And then we also have um, an evolving vision, the um, international collection. And the, that is a, a trip around the world looking at some of our international quilts that we have acquired. Now, those are not from the original James collection. Um, the James had, had just begun to really explore international quilt making traditions when um, the quilts came to us, but it was a major goal of theirs that we uh, really acquire um, Obviously, that's why we, uh, we chose the name the International Quilt Museum, because we felt that there was a lot to be discovered, a lot to find that we certainly didn't know about at all. So we went out and really have um, tried to work with scholars all over the world to build an outstanding um, international collection. 
And in that you'll see a lot of really wonderful items, um, particularly clothing, because in many other cultures, the way they use um, patchwork or quilting techniques was in clothing rather than in bed coverings. We also have hats, we have shoes, we have flags, all kinds of wonderful pieces that go into that collection. So um, Haley, have we got some questions that I can answer today? Absolutely. I think two of these questions kind of go together. So somebody asked in the chat how you defined a studio quilt. And I was wondering if you could define it for us, but also maybe talk about like some of the large scale nature of some of these quilts. Terry Mangit's work that we showed that we just had an exhibition of is, is huge and Aurora you could stand in front of, you know, for hours just because of the sheer size. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about defining it and then maybe just some of the things you've noticed about some of the large scale nature of studio quilts. Sure. You know, um, the definition of a studio quilt to me is really just based on the artist's intent. I don't think there's a way that you can define it by um, technique or materials. So when I talk to, say, a, a tour group or students about it, I say it's a quilt that was never meant to be put on a bed. It's not a functional item. It is meant to be an art piece. And that is a decision made by the artist. Now, that is a phenomenon that began um, in the late 60s and into the 1970s. Um, obviously, before that, there were quilts that were meant to be a woman's masterpiece that they did not use, even though they were functional in nature. So I do think um, we see, especially in the 1930s, with an artist like Bertha Stenge, who made some really amazing silk pieces that had a very religious um, theme to them. So there were art quilts being made earlier, but it, as, a, as a whole, it's a much later transition into quilting. And it's really the artist's decision as to what that quilt is all about. So um, when we get into um, qualifying things with labels like that, we always have difficulty. Um, it is a category that helps us to define what we're looking at, but it also can really trip us up because I wouldn't say that there's a quilt that isn't made that's not an art piece, but this is a very specific um, theme. It's a very specific decision made by the artist and they are working within that, the idea of, um, of exhibiting those pieces. The large scale part of the quilt, you know, I think it was just something that quilters were doing early on. And I really do think it has something to do with the, um, the fact that these artists had explored quilt making through traditional quilts. So they were still kind of working within that idea of a large scale piece. Um, today, I think that we still see artists working in large scale, but I think that the movement has been towards going towards smaller pieces, which in a lot of ways, I think is a practical decision. It makes more sense. If you're selling work, you need something that's gonna fit in a home. A number of the pieces we've gotten, in fact, a piece by Terry Mangat called Fireworks was given to us because the person who purchased it moved and couldn't fit it in her home anymore. So we had that happen in two or three occasions. Um, so I think that there's a practical element of it too. I have to say, I love the, the risk that an artist takes in making such a large piece. It's a commitment of a lot of time and energy and you don't know where that piece is gonna end up and you have eliminate, eliminated a lot of possibilities if it's in a really large scale. That makes sense. Um, the next question is, um, they posted it when we had Terry Mangit's work up talking about um, you know, some of the embellishments is, are there, you know, conservation concerns or storage concerns, or maybe even exhibition concerns when you're putting up a quilt like that, um, that you have to take that we have to take when, um, those kinds of no, things. No, there, there uh -huh. definitely is. And I always worry about, um, Terry's quilts because she used anything and everything on them. In fact, um, one of my favorite stories is when we were in our old storage room, I went to leave the room and fireworks was out on the table. And when I turned the lights off, the fireworks just slowly faded. And I realized she had used glow in the dark paint on her fireworks. And she used puff paints and she's got these tiny little foil embellishments on them. So it's a real concern. The wonderful thing is that um, because we have our quilts in such consistent environments, we're not seeing fabric loss. We're not seeing fabrics getting really dried out. You know, if you're using adhesives on your quilt or fusibles on your quilt, it's really a concern because they are going to eventually dry out and, and really cause problems. So right now after 
25 to 40 years, we're seeing really good results in the, um, the careful environment that we use. We also really do think about embellishments and things when we choose how we're going to exhibit quilts. We do an object review and the whole group of us from the curator to the exhibitions crew go in and we have to decide which is the best way to show a quilt. So we oftentimes will show them flat or on a roll or on a slant board. And it all depends on the condition of the quilt and any, any issues that we might feel are um, potentially gonna be a problem. And then somebody just popped in and wanted to know about temperature and humidity, which were something that you mentioned earlier. How can that affect a quilt? Um, maybe even just a, you know, a studio quilt with, with paint on it even. You know, it's going to affect any quilt because anytime, um, you know, here in Nebraska, for example, we go through really stark differences from humidity and dryness throughout the year, sometimes day to day. And what happens is your fibers will plump up with a lot more humidity. They will dry out with less humidity. And as they go through that back and forth, it's a chemical reaction that's changing. And eventually it's going to break down and it's gonna cause your fabrics to break. So we try to keep the collection at about 50% humidity. That's an easy one for us to keep it. Temperature, um, we keep it about 64 degrees, 66 degrees. Um, that is a space where we also work in. So um, we might at, um, push that up a little bit higher. About 62 degrees is probably ideal. Again, cooler temperatures are gonna slow down chemical reactions. So the cooler you can keep your quilts, the better. I'd say the most important thing is really to be very aware of what your general environment is and to check your quilts often. You don't wanna have moisture build up to the place where you get mold or mildew, which is not removable, is terribly damaging, but you also don't want them drying out. So it's really kind of a, an issue that's dependent on where you're, or where you're at in the country or the world. And um, off the top of your head, do you know the oldest quilts in the from the studio exhibition? I think the oldest that were shown was Michael James's 1978 quilt. Um, most are um, in the mid 1980s, and then I think just two in the early 1990s. That's great. I think that's all of our questions, Carolyn. You did a great job, and I think everybody liked the fact that you could zoom in and. Um, so I've posted a few links in the chat for everybody, the Matterport link, um, you know, where you can search the collection, the International Quilt Museum collections. Um, everything should be on there. I highly suggest following us on Facebook and Instagram at International Quilt Museum. If you haven't already, we post behind the scenes content, new exhibitions, all of that fun stuff. So um, I would highly suggest, uh, you know, following those pages. So thank you again, Carolyn. Yeah, for, you know, for go to our website. You can find all of our quotes. You know, I meant to check before I even got on to see about how many um, studio art quotes we have now. I think we have about 500 in the collection. Many of those we have shared with the Studio Art Quilt Associates to, on their virtual gallery. So there's a lot of ways that you can access and, and see what we have in the collection. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.